Good evening. Hi, and welcome. Uh, my name is Saria Cham, and I'm a part of the team that brings you Random House events. Today, we are joined by a wonderful group of authors for a special edition of One World Conversation Series, Ideas in Action. One World's mission has always been to find books for readers who want to rethink the past, understand the present, and imagine new futures. Ideas in Action takes its mission into an online space at a crucial moment. In the past couple of years, we've seen both an increase in extraordinary works by authors from the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander community, and a disturbing increase in hate and violence against these communities as well. Tonight's conversation holds space for our friends, families, and colleagues to examine notions of safety amid the rise of horrific incidents and to be present with one another in solidarity. Uh, Tonight, we're joined by a remarkable group of One World authors, including Valerie Kaur, Yin Yi, uh, Mira Jacob, and Kathy Park Hong. Um, we are going to start the conversation in just a moment, but before uh, we do, I have just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, firstly, uh, we, uh, if you would like to engage in the chat, we encourage that you do. Uh, we just ask that you please stay respectful. Um, if you have a question for our authors, there will be an opportunity to uh, pose your questions. You may drop your questions in the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, tonight's conversation is being moderated by Jafreen Udin. Uh, who is the executive director of the Asian American Writers Workshop. Uh, we are very proud to be in partnership uh, for this event with the Asian American Writers Workshop. Uh, if you would like to make a donation to the workshop, we'll be dropping a link uh, to their donation page in the chat. Um, we will also be dropping a link to the donation page to CAAV. Uh, organizing Asian communities. Um, so with that, I would like to uh, ask that our panelists join us uh, on our virtual stage, and we will start with a grounding by Valerie Kaur. Thank you so much. I'm really grateful to be with you all tonight. We are gathering tonight just hours after we got the news of the horrific mass shooting in Texas that took the lives of 14 children. So we're gathering tonight in a moment of profound pain. And I want to acknowledge the particular pain of all of you who are parents. I believe that we can only survive grief like this in community. So I invite you to take a few moments to breathe with me. You can place your feet on the earth and notice the difference between holding your body up and oh my love, just let the earth hold you up in this moment. You can close your eyes for a moment and just turn your attention inward and notice what you are carrying in your body. What is the shape of grief in your body? Where does it live? Good, and if you can find it in a place inside of you, I invite you to take your hand as if you're touching your beloved and just place your hand on the spot where it hurts. And know, my love, that this grief is not a sign of your weakness. It is a sign of your bravery. It means that you are awake to the world. You are facing this. Your grief is a sign of your capacity to care. And you do not hold it alone. So as you're feeling your feet on the earth, imagine that this earth is connecting all of us and as if you're drawing the breath from the earth itself, let it come. And breathe into that space of grief inside of you. Good, and let it go. 
turning your attention to the soil beneath you, imagine with me now the ancestors who walked on the soil before us. If you know the names of those indigenous ancestors, you can say them now. The Tongva peoples. Acknowledging their pain, their resilience, and their wisdom, past, present, and future. The ancestors of this soil know something about how to survive unspeakable grief. So we call them into the space now. And my love, I invite you to draw into your mind's eye one ancestor who makes you brave. It might be someone from your family or it might be someone from recent history. But as you choose that person, imagine them standing behind you now. Imagine their courage in your body. Good, now with the earth beneath us, connected to each other and ancestors behind us, I invite you to take a deep breath once more, let it come, let it go. And from this place of courage, we send our love to the families in Texas. And we send our love to the families in Buffalo. And you can send your love to anyone in your life who is surviving hate violence, state violence, or gun violence. And as we send that love together, imagine that we have turned this virtual space into a sacred space, that it's not just us who are gathering, it's our ancestors too. Good, may we show up with our whole hearts in this hour. May we be brave with our grief. May we, may we summon forth the wisdom that is needed in this moment. May we know that we are enough. Let it come and let it go. You can open your eyes, you can stretch. Thank you for going deep with me. Jeffrey. Thank you, Valerie, for grounding us and um, helping us feel a little bit more solid in an otherwise not so solid day, week, year. <laughs> um, um, I wanna thank One World for organizing this important conversation. I wanna thank um, our speakers who I'm just thrilled and honored to be in conversation and community with for the next hour. Um, I thought to kick us off, I'd love to go around um, to each of our speakers today and just introduce yourself and share one word um, that describes something that makes you feel safe. There are no wrong answers. Um, Valerie, why don't we start with you? Honestly, <laughs> the first thing that popped into my mind was Bridgerton. <laughs> is I want escape, escape, escape. But, uh, but truly, even then, I start to think about colonialism and hierarchy and the 1%. So I'm not totally safe even there. So I think the truest answer is, um, is the stars. When I get to look at the stars with my children, and I think about cosmic time. Oh, somehow that puts deep breath in my body. Mm -hmm. I love that. Uh, Kathy. You're I think you're on mute, Kathy. Mute. Rookie mistake. Uh, my answer is rather simple. I just, you know, it's family, friends, community. 
يعني ايه؟ um, the word that I've been thinking of is plant um, in two, two meanings like plants obviously plants but also planting being planted being still I've been finding a lot of solace in pauses and in pausing um, I was just holding a writing space before this and it started I started out feeling very anxious and um, two hours really does a lot just writing, pausing, so plan. And Mira? Um, I'm gonna go with the standby of food, which always makes me feel safe, but especially I think my favorite thing in the world is if I'm taking a nap and I wake up to someone cooking for me, I think I feel love more acutely in that moment and safety more acutely in that moment than in any other moment. Mm. Yeah, there's something wonderful about food you did not make for yourself. Can we just come over and do that for each other now? Yeah, I know. I was just thinking you that. You nap and I'll cook and then I'll nap and then you cook. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So, you know, when you're thinking about, you know, what makes you feel safe and, and safety, um, I want to start with with setting and, and location and, and the role of place, both physical and figurative in, um, in feeling safe or, or writing from a safe space. Um, so in each of your work, you know, can you talk a little bit about setting the role of location? Um, is there a specific location that you're exploring? Um, what draws you to any specific settings? Um, and like, what are you seeking? Are you looking for safety and comfort in locations? Do you need to write from a certain actual physical space to feel safe? Um, I'd love to just hear, I mean, all of you are, are brilliant and just the role that location and place plays in having a safe space for you in your writing process and that connection. Um, I'll open it up to anybody who wants to start or I can call on people, whatever. I can jump in. Um, one of the that actually makes me think of specifically when I was writing my last book, which was a bunch of conversations. I got really nervous in the middle of it of how many people were going to be disappointed um, by what they saw and or offended and or um, weirded out by me in whatever way that word can work. And um, and one of the things that um, Caitlin Greenidge told me in the middle of writing when I got my most scared was imagine the us. Like you have to imagine us and that we exist and that there are plenty of us who could be having this conversation too, who are having this conversation with you already. So when you say place, that's actually what comes to my mind was this imaginary us that I held in my mind, which I have a feeling my fellow panelists know a bit about when you're writing to an audience that people have told you maybe doesn't exist or um, or isn't nearly as present as as um, as you would like them to be. Um, but I felt like it was really centering for me to imagine that there was an us that I just hadn't quite found yet, but was waiting mm -hmm. to find me. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful. I can jump in afterwards after Mira's beautiful comment. Um, uh, I guess I'm, you know, my next book, uh, part of the location is a divided Korea. And, um, and I'm thinking, of, and it's also about uh, kind of a reevaluation re of the Cold War, which is, in a way, it was about making the Western hemisphere safe and matters of security. And I was thinking about, when we're thinking about safety, I was thinking about a lot about the border the line and how it, this line, a border and the technology of border determines whether one is safe or not, whether one is imprisoned or not, whether one is worth, uh, life is worth saving or not. So, uh, um, so I think it's actually really quite pertinent to this idea of safe safety and setting. and. I mean, quite frankly, after within the um, after what has happened just today, 
um, in talking about safety, I'd rather talk about how no one is safe, you know, and how the only, in this country at least, and the only people who are safe are white men. And we are living in a constant state of fear, rage, and mourning. And um, what I fear is that after a while, um, as it has been for uh, the majority of Ameri uh, some Americans, is that we become numb and that um, we kind of decline into this learned helplessness uh, where barrage with constant assault, we stop responding, stop even trying to escape when there's an escape route that is already, um, that is ahead of us. And um, I think, you know, Susan Sontag said, to feel safe is uh, if you feel, where, there, where people feel safe, there is indifference. And perhaps, and I, I'm just starting to think that, especially with the, the assaults and you know, the targeting of Asian American women, and also, um, you know, yeah, the gun violence and the overtuning of all of our rights is that we should establish that none of us are safe, and um, that we live in a necropolitical society. And, you know, we always say that the GOP and the government and have blood on their hands, but they're actually feeding off our blood. And um, by necropolitics, I'm saying that, you know, when it's basically what the politics that we've been living, where the people who live closer to the axis of power, their lives matter more than those who live furthest from it. And then BIPOC people and women are collateral damage for the preservation of a white, white supremacist society. Um, and we're, what we're seeing is that who, what, who we think of as unsafe, or it used to be that living in New York or living in a blue state meant that you were safe, but you know, at least for Asian American women, it's not true. You know. And also with uh, the possibility of uh, this extreme minority, uh, extremist minority de uh, determining legislation for us all, it, where none of us are safe. And so I'm just trying to kind of come to terms with, to that and how we are living in and we, how we have to come to terms, coming to terms that we don't so much live in a democracy but a necropolitical political state and how we and how we should respond to that. Yeah. Uh, Valerie, did you want to add something? Kathy's words about living in that constant state of siege, grief, shock and pain and trying not to go numb from it. I feel like that's how I would define most of my adult life. Mm -hmm. I, I became an activist 21 years ago, shortly after September 11th, when in the wake of that hate violence that followed the terrorist attacks, a family friend was the first person who was murdered. I wanted to be a scholar of religion. I wanted to teach, but his murder turned me into an activist. I was on the road trying to capture stories so that the nation would hear, trying to imagine the us, Mira. But back then, you know, I wrote from a state of siege and I put it on paper. I sent it out to book publishers and I got a stack of rejection letters saying that there was no us <laughs> who was going to listen year after year. My first proposal was 2003. Then the next one was 2005, then 2007, then 2012, and then 2016. And my whole life, I thought I was going to die with the music still inside me. I knew that I had so much to say because our communities had so much that they were surviving and not just the trauma, but I saw that we had wisdom to offer too. So that in 2016, my proposal was revolutionary love is the call of our times. And I think I just had to wait that long for someone like Chris Jackson to see us, <laughs> to imagine us, to publish us. And truly when Chris said yes to see no stranger, it was like taking the first breath I had ever taken. I took my family to the rainforest for a year. I stepped away from the front lines and discovered that I could not actually write from a state of siege, that I could not write or draw forth any wisdom if I wasn't breathing myself. And 
I had to leave the country to see the country <laughs> and to speak to the country. And it was there in the rainforest that, you know, the rainforest is warm and wet and generative, you know, it's like the womb of the earth in many indigenous cultures. So it was like, I felt, I felt safe for the first time in my life, safe, safe enough to write. And that is how the book came out of me. And now that I'm back, <laughs> I'm back in the country and the, the onslaught is still constant. It's even more relentless. I have realized that I, I need to carry the rainforest inside of me that those of us who are survivors of trauma or witnesses to collapse, we must be more than just victims. We, we must be pioneers of a new way of being human. How do we metabolize grief on a scale we haven't done before without going numb? How do we honor our rage, harness our rage? How do we choose to love, stand in dignity so that we're not becoming what we're fighting against? I think all of that has meant for me that I, I need to protect a sovereign space inside of myself that no one can touch, where the stars live, where the rainforest lives, and I need to write from that space. And so this, this new book, I have to return to the rainforest to write about it, but this, this new book is, is really about how those of us who are awake to the trauma, how we can and must protect a space of wisdom and solace and joy inside of ourselves. Um, thank you to everyone so far for all of your really amazing comments um, from all, all sides of the spectrum or planet, I guess, or the sphere. Um, I've been thinking a lot about that sovereign space that Valerie was just talking about, about kind of um, like my, my second book, which came out with One World Dream of the Divided Field, is... Um, I wrote that vocationally from my memory with the emphasis on my, because um, part, part of the impetus for the book was uh, I had come out of a, um, an emotionally abusive relationship wherein my own narrative, I had learned basically how to erase my own stories of, of my own lived experience, which I think you can kind of adjust the scales as you will, um, into society and history on what that looks like. Um, and for me, the book was in the process of writing the book. Um, it was very similar for my first book as well. Um, the actual you know, book that you can hold in your hands is, is really the edited kind of um, product of a larger process that was about me and for me. And um, I've been thinking a lot lately about um, how valuable the spaces I have cultivated for other people to find their memory and their voices and their stories has been, in, especially in the past couple of years, because we're able to do that whether or not we're in person together. Um, it's about the people who show up and it's about creating the occasions and the structures for those things to, to, to happen. Um, and so that's where I've been finding my work and where I've been finding hope and joy and love and all of those other things. Hmm. I want to connect a couple of things that came up, um, you know, Kathy mentioning and reminding us that no one is safe. And then Valerie talking about kind of protecting spaces that are safe for you and what that means for your craft. Um, you know, we're writing from places that are informed by the present that is just so anxiety and rage inducing. And we're also informed by histories of our communities and our ancestors that are also filled with trauma and oppression. And so, you know, there's a lot of discomfort. There's a lot of, um, you know, triggering that can occur when you're writing. So what rituals do you have personally um, that help keep yourself emotionally, mentally, physically safe, either before, during, or, or after you write? I'll open it up to whoever wants to jump in first. I can jump in with kind of a short um, answer, which is that, um, 
when my book first came out and I was getting interviewed for it, I um, was getting asked questions about uh, pretty traumatic things that had happened to me. And I started dissociating during interviews with people. Um, but I don't really have any ritual per se, but I do have kind of this intention of noticing when stuff like that happens and, and adjusting and adapting and changing the ways that I'm looking at the work. Um, yeah, I'll just, I'll just leave it there for now. Hmm. Mira? Yeah, sorry, there's a little noise back there. Um, the rituals that I go through, um, one of the things that, what well, I mean, to be totally honest, one of the things that I need a lot is, um, I just need to overhear, I need to listen to other people a lot when I'm writing, meaning I need to not read writers because I find their voices very seductive, but I need to listen to humans. So I find myself walking around a lot, a lot, a lot when I most need to write. And usually I find myself eavesdropping on people, um, sometimes to an extraordinary degree where I think they know I'm eavesdropping and that's not great. But I do feel like there's a kind of, um, something I really love about humans and the way we try to connect and the way we fail at connecting that really does fill me with a kind of um, a particular kind of love for us and an, and this need in return to try to communicate, even though I might not, in fact, be doing it in um, in the most convincing way possible. I think all of those things together kind of holding holding how how faulty um, our our systems of communication are and also sort of um, allowing myself into that into that space makes me feel um, sort of brave enough to do what can sometimes seem impossible. Um, it sort of gives me the kind of forgiveness that I need to approach the art in, and with the as an artist instead of as a critic, instead of as somebody who can write down a sentence and hate myself for the sentence I've written. So that's usually what I lead with. Oh, Mira, I know the critic really well. <laughs> the critic in my head. I even gave it a name. It's like the little critic. And I gave it a shape. It's like a ragged bird that likes to squawk in my ear. And that little critic got really loud in law school. <laughs> and, uh, and it gets loud every time I'm about to put art out into the world or I'm about to say something brave or tell a story I haven't told before. And I, I literally feel like when I'm sitting at the page, the little critic, you're not, you can't say that, you can't do that. They're gonna eat you alive. You're a lawyer talking about love. <laughs> no one's gonna take you seriously. You're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not, you're not enough. And it was, it was actually after my son was born when I was like, you are so good. You are so brave. You are so, he's like a newborn. I'm like, you are so, <laughs> and my husband was like, why don't you speak to yourself that way? Wow. And he was right. So I, I, I have a journal. Jeffrey and I have a journal that's my wise woman journal and I have a place where I put all of my thoughts and feelings and I vent and everything but I, this journal is only to hear her voice only to hear her speaking to me I have to practice speaking to myself as if I am so beloved to her so she writes wise woman here wise woman says oh my love she she's very sweet she calls me my love it's like you are tired you just sobbed in the bathroom so did Mira it's okay you're gonna pour yourself some tea <laughs> You're not going to be perfect. You're just going to be present. <laughs> and you're going to open your heart and speak. I mean, like literally she's seven years. It's, it's taken me seven years of practicing, listening to the wise woman in me. Every time I speak, every time I sit down to write. And it's only in listening to her voice in me again and again, have I finally learned how to love myself. Mm. I love that. A journal of positivity. We all that. Oh, she's not always positive, by the way. I just want to, I don't like the word positive because <laughs> she's like, you know, she'll tell the truth. And sometimes the truth is like, you're a mess right now. It's okay, but it's okay, right? Mm -hmm. To be compassionate and truthful is, is, is her voice. And I think that voice of wisdom exists inside of all of us if we're just quiet enough to hear it. <laughs> yeah. um, I guess my ritual is... Um social media no i'm just kidding um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's insta uh no i don't um i think 
I don't know. I'm trying to think of, I, I don't think like, I'm really bad at rituals. I have, I'm, I must admit, you know, I think, and you know, probably because I find writing itself is a ritual or the act of writing or preparing for writing, like making coffee and um, sitting down at a specific time. If I have the day free for writing and um, 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 staring at my computer or actually kind of jotting down notes on my notebook. And I often find that actually the ritual of writing can also, um, if it's going well and not when I'm not uh, uh, tearing my hair out, then it is actually a form of self-care. Um, even when um, I'm writing about something triggering, if actually when I'm writing about something triggering or writing about a traumatic event and it's actually, I'm able to actually get it down. Um, it's, it's as if I, I don't wanna say I've controlled it, but it's, it's, well, maybe I do. Like, it's like I've, by putting it down in writing, I've put some control over my emotions or my overwhelmed emotions over it. And then I'm able to turn it into uh, an art form, you know, or um, a, a composed paragraph, you know, so it's outside of me, it's no longer in me and kind of devouring me up. Um, so it, it actually, I would say the act of writing itself then is the ritual. I think perhaps uh, the, the before and after is more when the anxiety, the kind of goblins set in, you know, um, um, all around, all, you know, what <laughs> surrounds the, the writing, especially before a book comes out, uh, then I'm eaten up by anxiety and that not not enoughness, that um, inadequacy, and um, and also before uh, writing when it's not coming and not being patient. And I think this is a huge problem with me is patience and learning how to wait and um, sit just wait for the words to come. And um, I think a lot of times I uh, panic when the words don't come soon enough. And um, I guess I have tried, I have developed some rituals for that, which is, um, well, when I'm near a body of water, it's swimming, um, it's conversation that helps. But also actually for me, it is reading to show that I'm not alone. And if, especially if I'm working on something really weird, uh, I like to go and look at other uh, weird books and realize, okay, well, this person did it, so I can too. So this person took that risk, so I can too. And that gives me a lot of reassurance, even like, well, when we were able to, I think we can go back to libraries, but I haven't really been back going, um, I haven't really gone back to the stacks yet, really. But, you know, like going going to the library and like even just the smell of the stacks, you know, really, I find just really soothing and really comforting because it's like you're surrounded by authors who probably had the same anxiety that you did and but they wrote their books and now their books are uh shelved or in the stacks so it's really uh it brings me actually libraries bookstores give me a real sense of safety um yeah Kathy, can I just ask real quick, because you brought up something that I really love, which is the idea of trying to um, meet the anxiety with the writing, trying to, you know, like finding a way to turn mm -hmm. the anxiety to like hold it within the writing, right? Mm -hmm. To kind of put a framework around it. Or how old were you when you first did that? When, when I was able to yeah, like the first time you did that, when you tried to kind of, you know what I mean, like get, take an anxiety and, and write your way through to clarity. Oh, God. I can't I, I'm asking because, yeah, because something that I really loved about your book is that it sort of it sort of deftly takes us through, in fact, so many situations of anxiety. There's a real way that you have about sort of leading us through that to a kind of um, to a kind of uh, revelations that I know, you know, we've talked about this before, but I find really comforting. So it's really interesting to me that that's where this lands with you, because I feel like and I'm just curious about when it started. For well, you. I don't know. I think it started rather late because I think when I was younger, I used to drink away my anxiety, but like, you know, I just, <laughs> and, but, um, um, but I, I could give you a more recent example because when I like a more recent, most recent memory of me consciously doing that actually was when I was writing minor feelings where 
I was having partly because of the anxiety of the book, but also other mm -hmm. things going on and a lot of other things going on in my life where I would wake up in the morning and um, wake up in the, um, in the middle of the night in a panic. And I'm sure we've all had that, right? Where you wake up in a panic and then you can't, your mind is racing and you can't go back to sleep. And this was also when my daughter was like uh, two years old and I was already not getting any sleep. And I was also panicking because I was not writing at all. And I wasn't finding the time to write because I was also teaching. And it took me a long time to, instead of just lying there and allow, allowing my mind to race, to just get up and just start my writing day at three in the morning or uh, four in the morning. And that was a revelation. I guess that was like a more recent example of me being able to put a box around or frame around the anxiety. And magically after I wrote something down, weirdly, it was also a real moment of clarity. Like it was like everything was jumbled in my head. But when I started writing on my computer, I was like, I started to have that distance and that control and that clarity. And then by the end, I was able to fall back asleep for an hour at least before I started my day again. And I was kind of a wreck the next day, but I still felt good because I was like, okay, at least I got something down in the middle of my in the middle of the night. That's so interesting. Yeah. I'm sort of, Jeffrey, do you mind if we, if the other panelists answer that same thing? Cause I'm so curious yeah. about when that happened for you. Like, did you mind if I asked you guys that Yanyi and Valerie, when you first started to kind of use words to work your way around this? Uh, I, I guess I can kind of answer. So um, my, uh, I had actually, a, I had a very long roundabout way of getting to words as a place to actually be vulnerable and, and as, as a, or literature or language as a space that I could occupy. Um, because much of my, my personal history involves secrecy and not mm -hmm. saying the thing. Mm -hmm. And I think in my family, at least culturally, there was a lot of not saying the thing. Um, so it was very unsafe for me to write things down. Um, and, uh, it was really late in my writing practice. I think when I was in my mid twenties, when I started writing the work that would become the year of blue water, my first book that, um, I was like, oh, I'm genuinely free from what was once holding me back or what was once surveying me. I can be honest with myself and I can say whatever I want. And so writing was the very first practice of freedom for me. Um, and I, I kind of refined and continued that um, in, in many different ways um, since then. I love, did you say writing was the very first practice of freedom for me? Yeah. Ah! <laughs> because it was. That's amazing. Yeah. It's like, oh, I don't have to write all of my feelings into abstract images that only I understand. <laughs> Amazing. Interesting. Yeah, no, no, that's amazing. I'm, I'm writing that down. <laughs> I feel that. Right? I, feel that. I you know, I, I grew up on farmlands in California to Punjabi farmers who had farmed that land for three generations. And so we didn't have very many books in the house. It was, you know, the books I brought home that began to build our library. And yet <laughs> I was so quiet somehow my mother knew that I needed a place. And she gave me my first journal when I was seven years old. So I have journaled, <laughs> like it's, a, it's back there in the closet. I have all of my journals since I was seven um, every year uh, for the last, you know. And when I went to the rainforest, the one thing that I brought was a hundred pounds of journals. And it was my, like my, my father and my husband like pulled the writing desk on the mountaintop and my mother opened up this box of journals and I began to read my life and see it with new eyes and saw all of that anxiety and started to see just like, I could actually like map out the beginning of when, of the wise woman in me. It's like, oh, that there's that voice of compassion. Oh, there's that synthesizing and begin to like, wrap my arms around around all of me and and from there was where i began to write see no stranger i have to tell you since since i have two small children now they're three and seven i mean and this is what the pandemic has felt like for me like i was playing with my daughter she climbs on top of my head for a minute climbs back down looks at me with the sweetest smile and says mommy 
I went number one on your head. <laughs> I turned to my husband, I think it's, it's time for a break. Mommy needs a break now. It's time for a break now. And so <laughs> writing right now feels so impossible because the labor has felt so just I haven't been journaling like I did for most of my life. So I think, Kathy, I'm like taking notes. I'm like, maybe I should like get up from the bed where the children are on top of me <laughs> at three in the morning. So in that quiet hour, I can write because um, I, I need more strategies as it gets harder and harder to mother the children, mother the movement, show up in the world. Mm -hmm. But oh, my God, we need it because, as Yanni said, like, that's the practice of freedom. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have one more question and then I want to make sure to leave some time for some audience Q&A. We have a couple of questions already. If you have a question that you want to ask, please do use the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom screen and add your question to the list. Um, I want to end this kind of group discussion talking a little bit about community. Um, we think a lot about community at the workshop. Um, you know, what, what does community and family, either you know, biological or chosen, um, mean to you, and you know, how does it connect to making you feel safe? Um, but also on the flip side, you know, what do you do, or what advice do you have for people that um, might not have that that community, or might not be surrounded by um, that kind of a safety net? I'm an Aries. I'll just I'll just hop in and answer first. Um, the first thing that comes to mind for me is um, that community is a kind of intimacy, and intimacy is a process, and it's not based on affinity or or identity. It is based on who shows up and when and how. Mm -hmm. um, I'm teaching a poetry manuscript class with One World this month for Asian diaspora writers, um, poets. And I really feel as though it is kind of a working example of what I mean by this. Um, I feel as though we've, this group of people did not know each other and have very quickly, um, uh, very respectfully kind of looked at, um, in some, some people's cases, like, you know, all everything they've written for the past like couple of decades, like in manuscript form, obviously. And so there's an intimacy in that process. Um, there's been, you know, calling ins and, and namings of kind of like inter-Asian colonial legacies that we're still contending with um, that I think have been very generously addressed, for example. Um, so I've been, yeah, I'm just thinking about community as a process and, um, as something that's built outside of blood, label, identity, and all those things. Yeah, I love that. Um, I think so much, and I think so much of what I've been thinking about lately in terms of community, because it's felt so fractured, obviously, because of the pandemic, and also, um, and also because I sometimes feel like I'm in a waking dream. Um, like I and I have for I think many of us have for a couple of years where nothing um, quite penetrates and that and that makes me feel quite far away um, from everybody. One of the things I've been thinking about a lot lately is what what does it mean to be um, to show up and be good enough if imperfect and what does it mean if everybody can be of use and that means that you also have a use and i know that sounds really but because things have felt so strange lately and because it is a little bit like learning to um walk through a new world um you know in a different kind of um with a different kind of armor on because sometimes it feels like you're walking invisibly through a world. I think so much of what I've been learning lately is about what it means to show up in small ways in community and kind of hold those, um, hold the imperfectness of the moment and to know that any, that like even sometimes the smallest thing can be very useful. Um, and I, I know that sounds really silly, but it's been, it's been sort of, um, it's been a lovely and forgiving way to move through a world in a moment where I feel like there's so much I can't control 
like there's just so much I can't control and remembering that that every act that I do that is in community, however imperfect, um, works against all of those forces. Mm -hmm. That's sort of a way for me to kind of center and go forward. And I say that too, I think the second part of your question stumped me for a minute, which was what would you say to somebody who feels like they can't find um, that community? And I just sort of put myself in that, I've, I'm a little bit in that place myself right now. So I'm saying that as like, that's what I do right now in this moment where I'm also finding it hard to, to maneuver um, and finding it hard to ground myself is to kind of hold on to, to the idea of the small usefulnesses that I do hold um, and how all of those do add up to a, a community of their own. Mm. I love that. Um, Valerie or Kathy, did you want to add anything or we can start? Yeah, I'll say, I'll say something. I mean, I, I think like right now, I, you know, I want to kind of, uh, connect it to uh, the urgency of today and everything. And I think that in terms of community and um, I, I, you know, I think like with people who conversations with friends and um, people, there is both rage and I'm going to go back to this term, learned helplessness, which I'm really afraid of. And um, the saying that perfectly encapsulates this is like, we, I just feel like as Americans of the, of a certain, um, on the left, uh, are, we feel like we're frogs in a boiling pot, in a, a pot of water that's slowly boiling. And, um, and there's like, and there's almost a sensibility that rage, even anger, um, of course, people feel rage, but there's also this futility in this rage and almost a sense that if you if you have this rage, that there's nothing you can do about it that and um, and so we've reached and I think we've reached this kind of uh, uh, pitch because we've gone. I mean, we the GOP. Uh, the white supremacists have jumped the shark a long time ago, you know, and, um, and it's like, and I think that, you know, just, it's just, the violence is just, I mean, I, and not to be alarmist, but it's not alarmist, it's realistic, like, the violence is only going to get worse, as there are more, as um, uh, more and more, um, you know, as this country becomes a minority majority, it's the minorities, uh, the minority extremists are going to, uh, you know, get more violent um, as they are aware of themselves as more of a minority. And so I think when I'm thinking of community, um, I think of, yes, micro communities and communities where that healing and that rest and that uh, uh, sense of sanctuary is absolutely necessary. But I think uh, we also have to really change what community means on a larger scale, um, I, you know, like, uh, it, you know, maybe that can come through both if, if we're living in a state of mourning and rage and fear all the time, how can we build community from that? You know, what are the connections that we can draw from the Buffalo massacre and um, the massacre that happened today, which I think were predominantly uh, Latinx, children, um, I could be wrong, and, um, and, the, uh, and the Atlanta massacre. Um, is there a way to kind of uh, take these, uh, you know, take these, you know, different incident events and, you know, I mean, going to the second part of this conversation, find some kind of solidarity and what is that you know and that I guess that's really been my kind of what I've been struggling with and what I've been working for working towards more as a writer I think you know I'm not a political organizer so I can't really do this I can't I don't know what the strategies are for as a as a community organizer but I think as a writer I've been trying to kind of figure out uh, and try to find the language to find bridges, shared similar um, uh, language for our shared str struggles while also respecting um, our differences and, and so forth. Because I think it's that is going to be so important to um, combat 
you know, what the, this force <laughs> that is making us all unsafe. Yeah, I think making those connections is so important, especially, I mean, even just mm -hmm. within the Asian community, which is so, you know, vast and diverse, you know, post 9-11 violence against the Sikh community wasn't talked about as anti-Asian violence, but it is. Well, this is, yeah, I mean, I, you know, when Asians talk about anti-Asian violence, they have to go back to 9-11. Yeah. They have to talk about they have to talk about the hate, uh, you know, the hate crimes against, um, you know, the Muslim community and, um, you know, South Asians and, you know, and I know, um, or uh, people who are read as Muslim, I guess, basically maybe is another way to put it, or like, you know, or what happened after Trump got elected where there was another surge of violence and deaths against um, South Asians. Um, and, um, yeah, and then the, the mass murder of the Sikh community, and it's like, and there's this constant sort of centering or disaggregation of Asian American communities, and I know there's this uh, focus also on East Asians. You also see that, of course, with, this is uh, uh, off the subject, but you also see this with, like, uh, um, I like to disown them, but those Asian Americans who are anti-affirmative action, where they, when they're talking about, when they say, uh, Asians are being discriminated against. They're like, oh, we're not talking about the low income Cambodians among and all these people. We're talking about East Asians who are being discriminated against. And I'm like, what is this politics that you're practicing here? And, and, and so forth. And it's like we, and this is why of course, you know, we have to think of identity as less of an, a label and more as a verb, a shared struggle. You know, and that way, if we think of it as a verb, then it's much more, then we can allow, then it's much more porous and it's much more intersectional and it can involve a lot of overlapping, um, overlapping groups. Yeah. I, I want to share a moment um, that's come to me as I hear you speak and mm -hmm. 10 years ago, and I was standing in front of open caskets of people who looked like my family. It was in the wake of the massacre of Sikh Americans in Oak Creek, Wisconsin, in Gurdwara on a Sunday morning. And at that point, I had been organizing around white nationalist hate for more than a decade. And I had this feeling of like falling into the abyss. Like it was just, what was it for? What was all of that work for, if not to prevent this? And as I turned around, I had a sick brother, Amr Bala, who like caught me and we just, he's, he'd been in the trenches with me since 9-11 and we just, we just sobbed. Like we weren't just being strong for the families anymore. We just let ourselves collapse. And he said, and we, we, we may not live to see the fruits of our labor, mm -hmm. but we show up late, we show up anyway. And after he said that, the, the doors of the gymnasium opened and people started to come in and it was a trickle and then it was a flood and then it was 3,000 people in the community who did not know who we were, who did not know how to say six, you know, like who, and yet they showed up to grieve with us. And it made all of the difference for my community to know that we were not alone in our pain. And it made me realize like, Every time in U.S. history that pe when people who had no obvious reason to love one another came together to grieve, to organize, like that has given birth to new relationships and to revolutions. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was my, the promise that I have made. It was like, all right, I've spent the last 20 years organizing around hate. I, I've made a vow to spend the next 20 years organizing around love. Like, I think anti-racism is the bridge, but beloved community is the destination. And for that, we need to be able to develop inside of people the capacities to love one another, to grieve with each other, to harness our rage so it isn't learned helplessness, but it's actually creative energy. Because if we weep together, then we'll sing together and we'll find joy together. And, and that is the kind of community that's keeping me going now. And... I, you know, I just want to say, like, my project now is, is called the Revolutionary Love Project, like organizing around love. And 
we have a whole learning lo learning hub at seenostranger.com where people are taking these practices about how to grieve, how to rage, how to wonder, how to listen, how to breathe, and putting them into practice in their communities. So if any of you listening needs some medicine, all of it's for free. You go to seenostranger.com and you know that you are not alone. Um, we are almost at eight o'clock and I wanna be sure to get through at least a couple of the audience questions. I'm gonna actually combine a couple in the interest of time. Um, Bali asks, how do you balance the need to care for others with caring for yourself? And I'm going to add um, another question from another attendee that's related, but maybe not for each of you personally. How do you na navigate creative burnout? You can take I'm going to jump in because it's, it's going to be short because this is like, the it's like on my desk, the, the wisdom of the midwife. She doesn't say, Okay, push, which is what I thought it would like what it meant to be an activist is just to like push until I ground my bones into the earth. She says, no, my love, breathe and then push and then breathe again. You know, there's a kind of cadence, a kind of rhythm to sustain one's energy over any long labor, you know, the labor of raising children, of making a life, of rebirthing a nation. So I take out that post-it, right? Breathe and push and then let the wise woman in you say, okay, now it's time to breathe. And all right, now it's time to push. I love that. I, I, I think that's like the perfect distillation of how one cares for oneself and one cares for others. Like if you can't, if you don't breathe, you can't push. And um, it's so important. And I've gotten that question a few times, like, what do you do if you burn out? And it's like, in you know, I think that phrase breathe and push really encapsulates um, the reassurance that it's okay to take a break and to take time for yourself, you know, and to refuel, so. Mm. Yeah. Just, I, mean, I just wanna agree with that. I don't think I don't think I have anything to add to that because I think that's absolutely right. And I think that the biggest, um, the indicator for me, the game changer for me was when I really let myself know that I was taking a break rather than just wandering away. Mm -hmm. When I told myself I'm taking a break, I am going away, I will come back when I'm ready um, and just putting up that boundary, that made a huge, huge difference. Mm -hmm. Yin Yi, do you want to add anything? Same answer. I mean, again, perfect distillation. I was going to say by seasons. Um, so I have a fall, winter, spring, summer of my writing process. Um, and it can be a different season for different projects at any given moment. I try not to do more than three at the same time. <laughs> but yeah, it's seasonal. Mm. Um. I'm going to combine a couple of questions again to end us today on a note of um, both joy and reading recommendations, because who doesn't love reading recommendations? So um, to wrap up today, um, two questions. You can answer either one or both. Um, what have you read recently that you would recommend that's inspired you? Um, and what has brought you joy? Or if you want to combine them, what have you read recently that has brought you joy? Um, you could take the question either way you want. I reread a book recently. I, I do this every once in a while. Um, I reread um, T. Bowie's uh, The Best We Could Do, which I hadn't um, read in about a year. And I have to say that book is miraculous every time I read it. And one of the things that I most love about it and I say this um, because this is in Asian spaces, there's such, she does such a wonderful job of, um, of illustrating and, and explaining without explaining parents mm -hmm. who, um, who aren't necessarily warm, but really love you and whose love they may never be able to really say fully. She really holds a space for that in a way that I've rarely found in work and it's so comforting to see it. It's so comforting to recognize how I was parented in someone else's parents um, mm -hmm. and to think of how I might, I might change that going forward. So that's my recommendation. Mm. 
Valerie? Oh, I used to feel really guilty about feeling joy. And, uh, and then I realized like the sick spirit is, and I realized this in Oak Creek 10 years ago that the children who lost their parents, they organized a memorial and a run under the theme of Chardavikala. And Chardavikala means ever rising joy, even in darkness ever rising spirits, even in the pain of it all. And joy, I'm understanding joy is the energy that returns you to everything that is good and beautiful and worth fighting for. So on our darkest moments, I mean, today was so dark, but I'm gonna go downstairs and I will, I'm not gonna feel like it, but I'll turn on the music and I will dance with my children. And yes, it might be, we don't talk about Bruno, I'm um, for the hundredth time, but <laughs> but we're gonna dance because then they laugh and then I laugh and then they jump and then I my heart soars and I know that oh that joy is the energy that keeps us breathing and pushing and oh and as far as book re recommendations I mean just read Kathy <laughs> like read Mira and read Yanni <laughs> like my shelf is filled with one world books and knowing that I'm not alone is also a deep and profound sense of joy I'm taking all of you with me to the rainforest this summer and I'm so grateful to you mm. you mean literally right you mean yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll nap and cook for each other nap and cook for each other yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm so excited to go to the rainforest <laughs> I need the rainforest right now um I, I, my recommendation is yes, and the books that every, all, all, all the geniuses that I'm um, um, in on screen with uh, read all their books. Um, and also I want to, like, you know, yes, because it's an Asian American space, I want to give a shout out to a forthcoming book that I've read that I uh, loved. And it also uh, brought wisdom and joy, which is um, Ryan Lee Wong's book, which side are you on? It's a forthcoming novel that's going to come out in the fall. And it's just a wonderful book. And I was just thinking about that book because I was, we were talking about community and, um, you know, a lot of times someone was saying something about, I forgot who this writer said about um, coalition building is that it's not coalition building, you know, with the uh, groups that are not your family necessarily or your kin necessarily is not, um, you know, it doesn't happen at the home, you know, so it's, it's going to be uncomfortable, you know, and you just have to get used to that discomfort in, in, in that kind of coalition building. And he writes about that because the book is about uh, the LA riots and um, it's and his mother is a, a, a kind of an organizer of Black Korean relations during that time period, and it's his kind of con um, the character's conversation with her, and then kind of sort of bridging that time period with Black Lives Matter, and it's just really adroit and wonderful. And I also love this one kind of pearl of wisdom that came from that book where he was saying, you know, it's like, you know, we're organizing or co coalition building isn't about learning all the woke language and like, you know, having these really serious uh, uh, discussions where, you know, I'm also contradicting myself where you're made to feel uncomfortable, but it's also just like having a picnic and just having a barbecue and drinking beer together and drinking wine together. It's having fun together. It's having joy together, you know, and that is so important to remember, you know, and it's also important to remember that like joy is, I have to remind myself to have to, of joy because I can be pretty jaded a lot of the times but that joy you know joy is also for is is a is a form of resistance it's the form of resistance and it's always really important to remember that that being said what joy is to be now I mean my answers are boring because I'm um you know it's my kid it's my daughter uh it's also severance in Atlanta <laughs> and it's also yeah I guess like having dinner and having drinks with friends you know that brings me joy all right. Um, what what am I reading right now? This is going to totally out me as someone who's just really esoteric. I'm reading Archetypal Symbols and Fairy Tales by Marie Louise von Franz. Um, 
I'm really into the kind of esoteric and like Jungian symbolism stuff right now because of my one of my projects that I'm working on and I've just been really enjoying it there's also a great story of how I saw this on a cart outside of book culture in my last trip to New York and um, the cashier was like you got that off the children's cart so it, it turned out that um, someone had left some some academic had left this book on the cart and I got it for free um, but it felt like a total kind of magic moment and I, I love things like that I love surprise and coincidence and and the game of chance that is life um, where that kind of surprise gets to happen still. Mm, what a great note to end on. Um, I want to thank each and every one of you um, for joining us tonight, for being in community with us. Um, I want to thank the, um, everybody who signed on and joined us um, for the evening. Thank you so much. Thank you to One World for putting this together. Um, have a great night, everyone. Stay safe, hold each other, and find your rainforest wherever that is. Thanks, everyone. Good night, everyone.